Desperately Departing by Savage. Chapter 10. Remember that one scene from Spider-Man? Read by Alalo. Izuku was so stupid. Somehow, he had managed to attract the attention of Eraserhead and even got him to train him a bit, which Izuku was very against at first, but after he assured him over and over again that he wouldn't be a burden, he finally agreed. And now he had somehow tricked him into believing that he could be a hero. Why not just get a proper license? Like it was that easy. He said it was as if Izuku wasn't useless and a bother to everyone around him. The only reason why he was still sticking with this whole vigilante thing was because he helped more people than he hurt. And don't even get him started on the media writing multiple articles on him and naming him Serpentine. When had he, when he had learned of what had happened, he wanted to crawl into a dark cave and die there. As if he could. How did he get the att attention of people and convince them that he was a proper vigilante? Although, technically, that wasn't vigilantism, because the textbook definition of vigilantism is the illegal use of a quirk against the villain, and Izuku didn't have a quirk, or at least a useful one. So what he was now... So, he was now lying to everyone and tricking them into thinking that he was capable vigilante when he wasn't even a real vigilante. Of course, it wasn't like he asked to be outed to the world, but he must have done something wrong. He always does. Izuku climbed through his apartment window and changed out of his vigilante gear. He had made some improvements in the past months. He got a new black hoodie just for his vigilante work and some black joggers that he found was gifted. The only issue was that he that they were a bit tighter than he wanted. They weren't too terrible, just more leggings than joggers. But Izuku would take what he could get. Legally dead beggars couldn't be choosers. He had a black util utility belt that held two pipes. He was just learning how to use correctly with a razor head, a small knife that he had found in one of the kitchen drawers, and some very basic first aid. Izuku didn't necessarily need it, but bleeding out when he wasn't dying was pretty annoying and messy, so he decided it was probably best to have some bandages on hand, just in case. He also had a few more things to help any injured civilians he might find. And he still had the face mask covering his mouth and nose, but he found one that was a lot more breathable and ventilated so that he didn't feel like he was dying every time he decided to go for a bit of roof hopping. You know, as you do. And of course, he still wore his red shoes. The only other shoes he had were dress shoes that pinched his feet. Eraser had actually commented on his cho cho choice of footwear a few times. Izuku could tell that he didn't really like them. That he probably thought they were impractical and distracting, but he just couldn't bring himself to let them go. When he was little, he and his mom didn't have all that much money, but she would always would sometimes take him to the mall and let him pick out one or two things that he wanted to buy. He distinctly remembered this one time where he couldn't find anything he really wanted until they passed this shoe store and saw these bright red sneakers in the window. Izuku was captivated and practically bounced as they stood in the checkout line of the store. He didn't know why he liked them so much, but his mother found it adorable and made sure to match him made sure to match him any time she could by wearing something red. Sometimes she would end up looking like Christmas decided to come early, but he just loved that she was happy. The kids at school didn't like his shoes nearly as much as she did, but Izuku didn't care. Even though he felt guilty every time they had to buy a new pair because his classmates had decided it would be funny to destroy or ruin his shoes. He just couldn't let them go. He kept wearing them and eventually his classmates got bored and moved on to teasing him for something else. And the only other change he made to his costume was giving up covering his hair and instead tying it back. 
His hoodies were always too big to keep up the hood and it was annoying to keep having to keep track of it during fights and stuff. But his hair was just as annoying. It kept on getting in his face and would frizz sometimes due to the humidity, humi humidity in the air. Oh, that's a hard word. So Izuku just started carrying around hair ties and it had done wonders, especially since his hair had been getting pretty long. Izuku decided that he would prob that he would go out and shower in the morning after he got sleep. You would think that after so much you'd stop being so tired, but unfortunately tiredness was simply becoming a part of Izuku. He had a the theory that it had something to do with him dying or whatever, but he couldn't really pr prove it until he manages to die again. Actually, that's not that bad of an idea. It had been a while since everything had happened, and Izuku had thrown himself into saving those around him to distract from the whole wanting to die thing. But it had been long enough. Couldn't hurt to try again. So, the next night he went out, he had set a goal, unlike most nights. He still ended up getting mixed up in a few fights, but things like that just tended to drift to him. He didn't even seek it out. It was like he was a trouble magnet, and honestly, that probably wasn't too far off. It had been hours since he had left his apartment, and Azuku finally felt like he had some time to himself. After double and triple checking that no one needed help in the area around him, Izuku found himself on the edge of one of the tallest buildings in the neighborhood. He knows that the last time he tried jumping, it didn't exactly work out, but he, but it was a lot less messy than trying to find someone who would be willing to kill him. And who's to say that they wouldn't kill other people too? Better not getting, better not get anyone else involved. Izuku didn't trust himself with a gun, so that was out. A knife was too messy and pills were expensive, and he'd rather steal as little as possible. He didn't feel like finding any rope, and drowning just honestly didn't sound like a good time. Same thing with fire. Who knew dying would be so much work? The night felt good. The air wasn't too cold or too hot, and the sky was clear. And this area didn't have too much light pollution, so Izuku could see some of the stars above him. He realized that he did this thing before he jumped. He just looked out and took in everything around him one last time. It was like this last time as well. As crappy as the world around him was, it was pretty beautiful. Then came that feeling again. The feeling of free-falling, no regrets, no hesitations, no worries, just release and hope. The ground came quickly and before he knew it, Izuku was plunged into darkness once again. Shota knew he was brooding as he patrolled, but he couldn't help it. Once again he had upset the kid with something that he said and now it was all he could think about. Who says no to being a hero? The kid is so excited about every hero he meets. I would have thought that he jumped at the opportunity to become one, but he didn't just say so. He didn't just say no. He ran away. What would he, why would he do that? Razor could feel the headache coming on, which was no surprise at, at all, considering who he had to deal with on a nightly basis. Speaking of which, he hadn't actually seen the kid at all tonight. It was weird. Ever since he knew him, the kid had taken a single night off from beating up thugs and criminals. And he always somehow found himself around Racer. So what was going on? He took to looking a bit more closely as he ran across the rooftops. The area he was in was a bit different than his usual patrol. It wasn't too far away, but the buildings were a lot different. Everyone was unique and that meant that roof hopping was a lot more challenging. Not that it was any I issue for a racer, but it might be the Serpentine who was still fairly inexperienced. Shota's eyes had become pretty attuned to the green hair. It blended it pretty well with the night, but it stood out just enough to a racer. The kid looked like he was scanning the area around him. He was stood on the tallest building around and it must have been an event amazing vantage point. 
Man went to check it out himself. He was about to call out to the kid when his heart stopped as he fell off the edge. Kid, kid! Chowder to raced towards the falling child. He must have slipped or some his footing or something. And he wasn't coordinated enough to correct himself. Oh, no, 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 no. Eraser pushed himself to move faster, but he knew. He knew that he wouldn't be fast enough. So he tried to use his capture weapon, but it hit the edge of another building and missed and caused Shota to choke in his breath. By the time he reached this kid, it was too late. His small body laid at his feet, crumpled and unmoving. It wasn't fast enough. What was Shota going to do? He had known this kid for a few months now, and he was dead right in front of him. He had been worried about that this would happen. He just thought it would be in a different way. That's why he insisted on seeing him every night and trained him when he could, but all that was in vain now. Damn it. Toguchi agreed to meet him when Shoda called him. It was clear that his tone had set off alarms in his friend's head, but he couldn't bring himself to put up a front. He couldn't really bring himself to feel anything either. He was just numb. Stuff like this came with the job. You would think that Eraser Hood would be used to it by now. But every time he found someone dead, he couldn't help but blame himself. If he had only been just a bit faster, stronger, better. If he hadn't been a second too late, they might still be alive. He knew thinking like that was illogical. He was human, and he can't expect himself to be perfect. But that doesn't stop himself. But that doesn't stop him from trying. He can't save everyone. He learned that at a young age, before he even graduated. It was a lesson he knew he'd never forget, and he didn't want to. It drove him to be better, to try harder. He still missed him every day, though. The pain had dulled over the years, but it never truly goes away. Shota had begun to be known for his uncaring attitude and coldness after that. It wasn't his fault, that was just how he coped. He shut himself down and refused to dwell on anything that wasn't hero work. Was it unhealthy? Yes. But that was how it was. He wasn't as closed off as people usually thought, but he refused to let himself get attached. Or at the least, that's what he told himself. Hey, the foot footsteps sounded behind the racer head and he knew exactly what it was before they even spoke up. The footsteps stopped just behind him and he felt a firm hand on his shoulder as he sat by the bod as he sat by the body blank. Oh. Yeah, I found him seconds before I, I was too slow. Tsukuchi kneeled beside Shoda, never moving his hand on his shoulder that had become somewhat of an anchor for him and examined, examined the scene. I'm sorry. He was just a kid. I know. The two of them sat in silence for a few more minutes before Shota's head finally cleared and they both decided that they needed to get his body to the morgue and figure out who he was. The trip was easy and they dropped the kid off and when they dropped the kid off, Eraser refused to leave. He just wanted to be with him a bit longer and seeing his face would help them figure out who he was quicker and easier. Tsuguchi had no objection and sat beside Shoda as the two put in some dis... Discerning? Disc... Uh, factors that had began going through the list upon lists of names. It was harder than they both initially thought. Sure, the kid looked rather plain, but surely they, there weren't that many green-haired, green-eyed teenagers in Japan. Knowing more, some more things would, would have been a lot easier. But Racer had never really figured out what the, the kid's quirk was, or even asked. He never saw him use it, so he suspected it was a probably non-physical quirk. Hours passed and the two of them had come up with absolutely nothing. Shota was getting frustrated and Izuki keep, kept on reminding him that the kid's body would need to be taken care of soon, which just put him in even a worse mood. Shota had just agreed to leave and continue looking tomorrow after he got some sleep and Tsukuchi was on the phone with the examiner telling her that she would 
could come over when the slightest movement caught his eye. His head whipped to where he had seen it, but it was just the kid's body. Nothing was around it could have been. Nothing was around that it could have been. But that didn't make sense. The racer's senses were on spot, were spot on, and he knew that he had seen something. So what could he it have? One moment the room was quiet, and then the next, uh, the seemingly dead body shut up with a gasp and ended up falling onto the floor. What the fuck?